RAE's interest in vertical takeoff and landing is both wide and long-standing. And today it extends all the way from helicopters to less conventional types like the rotodyne and even the hovercraft up to the pure jet vertical takeoff aircraft, which in principle are capable of very high forward speed. Work at this end of the speed scale started with the Flying Bedstead in 1952 in cooperation with the Rolls-Royce company. Our work on the Bedstead, the world's first pure jet vertical takeoff machine, was mainly concerned with the problems of control and stabilization while hovering. This research contributed a great deal to the success of the SC-1 aircraft. The SC-1 gets its vertical lift for takeoff and landing from four lightweight jet engines mounted in the fuselage with intakes on the top and the four nozzles underneath. A fifth engine provides forward propulsion. At zero and low speeds, of course, normal flying controls are ineffective and stability is lacking. We make good these deficiencies by tapping high pressure air from the engines and feeding it to nozzles, like this, at the nose and tail of the aircraft and at the wing tips. The flow through these nozzles is controlled partly by the pilot and partly by the demands of an auto stabilizer. The SC-1 was ordered from Messrs. Short Brothers in 1954 and throughout its development there has been the closest possible cooperation between the manufacturers and the RAE. It is now our main research tool for the study of the problem of control of an aircraft from a vertical takeoff through a transition to normal flight and back again to a vertical landing. The main objects of research are to determine how much control power the pilot needs and what is required from the auto stabilizer. Then the aircraft lifts cleanly off the ground or the platform and pausing for a final check then turns into wind and accelerates rapidly away into normal flight. The whole maneuver will have been recorded on instruments in the aircraft. After further detailed tests, the aircraft returns to base, slowing down all the while and comes to rest before the pilot lowers it gently onto the ground, as befits anyone handling a million pounds worth of research equipment. The advantages which either vertical or short takeoff and landing can offer are so obvious that we are investigating several alternative approaches to this problem. One is to pivot the wing so that the thrust line of the propellers can be tilted. In this model, designed for tests exploring this method of vertical takeoff and landing, the wing can be moved in stages representing the transition from vertical to forward flight. Another area of interest has been in aircraft which, although they will not take off vertically, will only require a short runway. Unlike present day short takeoff aircraft, they would have quite a high cruising speed, yet would still be able to generate a high lift at a slow speed for takeoff and landing. The normal way to increase the lift of a wing is to use a trailing edge flap, but there are limitations, such as the size of the flap, to what can be achieved. If instead we use the jet engine efflux to provide a sheet of fast moving air which can be directed downwards from a slot in the trailing edge of the wing, this will behave rather like a very large flap. This is the basis of the jet flap. For cruising flight, the jet sheet would be directed backwards to give the normal thrust. Considerable use has been made of various flow visualization techniques during experiments on jet flap models. This smoke passing over a wing section demonstrates the very large lift being generated by the way in which the air flows round the wing nose and is directed sharply down by the jet flap. In order to find out how the jet flap would behave if applied to an aircraft, this model was constructed and tested in a wind tunnel. The jet sheet is made visible by spraying water into it and the board under the model represents the ground so that forces on the model during takeoff and landing may be measured.